the appearance of the unborn. Still, it is said that the Lord is there to glorify the pious King Yudhisthira. Lord Sri Krishna certainly wanted to establish the kingdom of the Pandavas for the good of all in the world. When there is a pious king ruling over the world, the people are happy. When the ruler is impious, the people are unhappy. In the age of Kali, in most cases, the rulers are impious, and therefore the citizens are also continuously unhappy. But in the case of democracy, the impious citizens themselves elect their representative to rule over them, and therefore they cannot blame anyone for their unhappiness. Maharaj Nala was also celebrated as a great pious king, but he had no connection with Lord Krishna. Therefore, therefore Maharaj Yudhisthira is meant here to be glorified by Lord Krishna. The Lord had already glorified King Yadu having taken birth in his family. Although he is known as Yadava, <coughs> Yadavira, Yadunandan, etc., he is always independent of such obligation. He is just like the sandalwood that grows in the Malaya hills. Trees can grow anywhere and everywhere. Yet because the sandalwood, because the sandalwood trees grow mostly in the area of the Malaya hills, the name sandalwood and the Malaya hills are interrelated. Therefore, the conclusion is that the Lord is ever unborn like the sun, and yet he appears as the sun rises on the eastern horizon. As the sun is never the sun of the eastern horizon, so the Lord is no one's son, but he is the father of everything that be. Om Jnana Tumarandasya Jnana Jnana Shalakamaya Jatsurun Nivitam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Visham Stavitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Gurvam Dadamayam Pradhati Svapadantikam Bande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamsya Shri Rupam Sakrachatam Sahagana Radhatam Vitamtam Sajayam Sadvaitam Sahadutam Parajana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Ramana Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Jitamsya He Krishna Karna Sindhu Dhiya Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kantam Radha Kantam Namostute Dr. Kanchan Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Dhrishvanam Sutre Gauri Pranami Nari Priya Vansha Kalpa Tadubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Vaivacha 
depart to Dwarka and of course at that time Ashwatthama had thrown Brahmastra weapon at Uttara and Uttara had come to Lord Krishna to take the embryo in her womb which Lord Krishna did. So then Queen Kunti is coming before Lord Krishna and she's offering her heartfelt prayers and she is describing the bewildering nature of Lord Krishna's appearance. Do we want translation? Yeah. So, in English, we're comfortable with the Hindi translation. Do you want to translate the Hindi translation? Yes. Do you want to translate the Hindi translation? Only one or two, so they can be translated in Italian. Do you want to translate the Hindi translation? Yes. सब इंग्लिश समझते हैं सब इंग्लिश समझते हैं कोई है हिंदी जो चाहता है हाथ ऊपर करें उसमें क्या है माता जी और आप आप माता जी तो आप साथ बैठ जाओ दोनों और इन माता जी के हम ट्रांसलेट करो ना वही बैठ जाओ साथ में बैठ जाओ थोड़ा पीछे वहाँ बैठ जाएं सब हिंदी वाले जो वहाँ पे वहाँ पे चले So Queen Kunti is <coughs> offering her prayers to Lord Krishna. She describing the bewildering, bewildering nature of Lord Krishna's pastime. And it begins, of course, with Lord Krishna's birth. Because Lord Krishna is described as the unborn, meaning one who never takes birth. But still he comes into this world, he appears in this world. So there are some contradictions which are bewildering for people, for common people. They are not able to understand sometimes the inconceivable potencies of the Lord. Just like in Ishopanishad, it is stated in the Ishopanishad, Tad ejati, tad naijati, tad ture, tad vantike. That the Lord walks, but he does not walk. That he's far away, but he's very near as well. He's within everything, but he's also outside of everything. So when there are these apparent contradictions, when, then we should understand this is the inconceivable potency of the Lord. But common people, that's difficult for them to accept that there is such a thing as inconceivable potency. But there are, of course, every day we see inconceivable potencies. We see the sun, the light of the sun, the energy, the heat, which is coming from the sun. Just one second of the energy which is coming from the sun, which is lighting up the whole universe, it could supply electricity for the whole of the UAE for generations. There's just one second of the energy coming from the sun planet. So we, we have to understand 
that even in our daily life there are inconceivable potencies. And the Lord, who is the source of all of this creation, He possesses unlimited potencies. And His pastimes are performed for the pleasure of His devotees. When He comes into this world, His mission was described Paratranaya uh, Sadunam Venus Chaitanya to give pleasure to the devotees, but at the same time, the, uh, the devotees, they're sadhus, they're already transcendentalists, they're already delivered. We may think, oh, the Lord is coming to deliver the devotees, but He, he doesn't have to deliver them because they're already, they're already surrendered to Him. Why does then, why then is He coming? He's coming to give pleasure to them, to be with them, to spend time with them, because they want so much to see the Lord and to be Not only do they want to see the Lord, the Lord wants to see them. And so the reciprocation there, the loving relationship between the Lord and His devotees. So the Lord is unborn. And different reasons were presented why the Lord appears. So why does He come at all? To give pleasure to the pious King Yadu? Well, that's one possible reason. There, of course, there's many possible reasons why the Lord, we will hear in future verses, other reasons why the Lord could have come. We, we have to understand the Lord's purpose in coming to... He doesn't need to come to kill the demons. He can do that just simply by His potencies. He's already in the heart of every living entity. And so if He wants to remove someone from the planet, He can do it very easily. Just by the, the sudden heart attack, you know, that takes people out of the material, out of the material body. Krishna arranges these different things. So Lord Krishna's purpose in coming to this world is not so much to kill the demons, but it's more to give pleasure to his devotees. And that pleasure of the devotees is enjoying the pastimes with the Lord particularly the childhood pastimes. Those of you who are mothers, you will know when the child is a child, when the young child, when you have your young child, that is the enjoyable time of being the mother. Once they grow up, then they'll fight with you and they'll quarrel with you. And there'll be many arguments and disagreements. And it won't be quite the same. You know, little children, very nice, you know, little boy will hold your hand and so boy grows up, he's not going to hold your hand anymore, you know. <laughs> he's not going to be listening to mommy anymore. They grow up, children grow up, and then the relationship is not quite the same. But while they're young, you enjoy the pleasure of having the child. Mother Yashoda! She enjoys the childhood pastimes with Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna performs so many nice pastimes with Mother Yashoda. Of course, every year in the month of Damodar, we remember Mother Yashoda and her wonderful pastimes with Lord Krishna, how she can tie up baby Krishna. And Lord Krishna can enact the drama of being chased by Mother Yashoda and he's crying but it's all he's putting on an act you know he's not actually afraid but he, he's a very good actor and Mother Yashoda is also enjoying the drama chasing Krishna and capturing her son and we heard that Krishna is not afraid of anything, 
fear personified is afraid of him, but he is afraid of Mother Yashoda. When Mother Yashoda is chasing him with a stake, holding her mortar stake in her hand, Lord Krishna is running, Oh no, Mommy, please don't hit me. You know, Krishna is putting on a, an egg, he's enjoying this loving exchange with Mother Yashoda. And Queen Kunti is remembering all of these different events. Queen Kunti has the relationship of being the aunt of Lord Krishna. So she's also very fortunate, not quite on the level of Mother Yashoda, but certainly she's very, very fortunate that she can enjoy such intimate relationship with Lord Krishna. So Queen Kunti compares Lord Krishna's appearance in this world. She, he says, she says, just like sandalwood appears in the Malaya hills. Sandalwood, of course, is the very valuable wood. You have a, one tree of sandalwood, the whole forest is made very fragrant, very beautiful. Srila Prabhupada uh, was describing about how we had, uh, in Srila Prabhupada's time, one Chinese man had become a devotee in Hong Kong and he had translated the Chinese Bhagavad Gita. And so Prabhupada was very pleased and he was saying that, he said, you're, you're a credit to your, your race. He said, just like one tree of sandalwood in the forest uh, makes the whole forest very fragrant and very valuable. He said, so the same way you are a credit to your race because you have translated this Bhagavad Gita into the language of the Chinese people. So the same way Lord Krishna, his appearance in the Yadu dynasty is compared to sandalwood in the Malaya hills. Malaya, Malaysia, we have the country Malaysia. If you go to Malaysia, you'll see that so many forests everywhere. The whole area, so much, so many trees. And it's all covered with uh, trees everywhere. Some areas you go, you see they have mountains and there's not tree on it completely bare, you know, just rock. But in Malaysia, everywhere they have trees. They have trees growing everywhere. And of course, uh, they, they planted, first of all, it was coconut trees, and they were tapping the coconut trees to get the coconut oil. And then it became palm oil, because the, coconut, the value of coconut oil went down, so they all switched to growing palm oil they have palm oil trees. Nowadays the prices come back up a bit, so some people are growing coconuts again. Or rubber, that's rubber, not coconut, rubber actually. Philippines they have coconut trees, but Malaysia has rubber trees. And a lot of people were brought from India to do the rubber tapping on the plantations there. So Malaysia, it used to be sandalwood was there. But the people only there would only be one or two, a few trees, not many. So they clear the whole forest, you know, and plant rubber trees, and then palm oil trees. They use the palm oil. But these things, palm oil and rubber oil, and nothing compared to the value of sandalwood. Sandalwood is so valuable. It's the most wonderful, fragrant wood. And we use it, of course, when we worship Lord Krishna, sandalwood paste. Every morning we would put sandalwood paste on Prabhupada's forehead. Sometimes uh, people think in the cold weather we shouldn't put the sandalwood paste on. But I asked Janani Vas Prabhu about this. You know Janani Vas? Janani Vas is a pujari. He's very very, you know, he's my age, you know, he's very old. And uh, he was in Mayapur in Prabhupada's time and they were always putting sandalwood paste every morning. 
And he told me, yes, that even in the cold weather, Prabhupada wanted sandalwood paste. Huh? So if you have a murti or Prabhupada or you're doing puja like that, you can remind the devotees that even if the weather gets cold, you may think, oh, we want to put sandalwood paste on. No, but actually Prabhupada wanted every day the sandalwood paste, the chanda. It's very pleasing to Prabhupada. He liked it. Cool, cool the brain a bit, you know, he puts the sandalwood on. So sandalwood is uh, some very valuable fragrance. And Lord Krishna also enjoys that fragrance. His lotus feet are decorated with sandalwood paste, with tosi leaves. The tosi leaves and some with sandalwood paste are decorating the lotus feet of the Lord. Especially it's in, in Vaikuntha, it's described when the four Kumaras came there to Vaikuntha. The four Kumaras, of course, they were stopped at the seventh gate entrance into Vaikuntha, Jain Vijay stopped them. And it, while they were, while there was a confrontation between the four Kumaras and Jain Vijay, at that time Lord Padmanabha came forward. Lord Padmanabha, of course, is the Lord of Vaikuntha, and he came forward with the Goddess of Fortune. They came from their residence, they came to see what was going on. Of course they knew what was going on, but the Lord came anyway. And when he, when Lord Padmanabha came there, then the four Kumaras, they, ex, they smelt the aroma of the sandalwood and the tosi leaves from the lotus feet of the Lord and it entered into their nostrils and they experienced a change in their body and in their mind. There's a nice verse. Tashyaravinda nayanasya padaravinde yanjau kamisha makarandavaya Like that. The four Kumaras they experienced a change in their body because they had heard about the Lord of Vaikuntha and they had heard about devotional service, but somehow they were not so much attracted. They were more inclined towards impersonalism. They were inclined to meditate on the impersonal Brahman. You may come across people like that in your own experience, among your own family, among your friends, and whatever, that not everyone is inclined to worship the deity, to go to temple and worship the deity. It takes a special quality, some devotion is required. But for other people, something like the four Kumaras, of course, four Kumaras were very exceptional, they were Brahmaganis, you see? They were not Mayavadis, they were not offenders to the Lord, but they were more attracted to the impersonal Brahman. So they came there to the door of Vaikuntha and they were restricted by Jain Vijaya. Lord Padmanabha comes and then and they get that experience, they got the, the, the aroma of the sandalwood and the tosi entered into their nostrils and they experienced a change. So it's a very good preaching verse. If you know any people who are, you know, Brahma Gyanis or you get people who are Gyanis, they study more the Upanishads. Then you get quite a few different groups like that, they won't speak on the Bhagavad Gita. They won't speak on Srimad Bhagavatam. They will speak on the Upanishads, the different Upanishads. They like to speak on the Upanishads. Because they 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 only accept the the Shruti. They don't accept the Smriti. 
Shruti means the Veda, the four Vedas. Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Atharva Veda, Sama Veda. They only accept the four Vedas. They don't accept Bhagavad Gita, don't accept Puranas, so they don't accept Srimad Bhagavatam. So four Kumaras were somewhere like that. They were more inclined towards the impersonal Brahma. Although their father, Lord Brahma, had been telling them about the wonderful nature of the Lord of Vaikuntha and the spiritual world and the importance of bhakti and devotion to the Lord, but they were just attracted to meditation on the Brahma. If you read Sanatana Goswami's Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, you can read how this one cowherd boy from Govardhan, his name was Gokumar, yeah, and he had a mantra by the grace of his guru, and he was able to go to different places, both within the universe and beyond the universe. Anyway, it tells how at one point he went to Tapaloka. Tapaloka is way up at the top of the universe, above Swargaloka. Above Swargaloka is Janaloka, Mahaloka, then Tapaloka, and above Tapaloka, Satyaloka or Brahmaloka. They're way up at the very top of the universe. So the four Kumaras, they reside in Tapaloka. And this cowherd boy from Govardhan, Govkumar, he went there and he met with the four Kumaras. And they were discussing. Four Kumaras were, they just liked to meditate. Govkumar, he was a cowherd boy from Govardhan, he said, he liked to do service. He liked to be active in the service of the Lord. He liked to have loving exchange with the Lord to play the flute and to dance with the Lord, enjoy these different activities. But the four Kumaras said, no, we just like to meditate. They were just inclined towards meditation. And they argued, this is actually meditation. It's a way, it's a goal. It's a, it's a very nice discussion. If you have time, you get a copy of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, please try to read it about Gokumar going to Tapaloka and meeting with the four Kumaras and they discuss the merits of meditation against devotional service. Of course, we are also meditating. As devotees, we also meditate, we also fix our mind on Krishna, right? We say, smartavyam satatam vishnu vishmartavya najatu. Of all regulated principles, the most important regulated principle, always remember Krishna or Vishnu and never forget. So how to do that? Because we have to remember Krishna. Antakale chamame vasmaran One who remembers the Lord at the time of death, then you can go back to be the fruit of the Lord. But yam yam bhavismaram bhavam chajiti antikale varam. Whatever you remember, you will get that destination in your next life. If you are thinking of your dog, at the time of death, then what will happen? <laughs> Might become a dog, yes. You have to be careful. Bharat Maharaj is the example that Bharat Maharaj was a greatly advanced devotee. He had given up everything. He had renounced the kingdom and everything and gone off to the Himalayas and gone up to Ganduki where the Shaligrams are, and he was residing there, and he was supposed to be doing his meditation and sadhana, but he got involved with 
a little deer. He became attached to the little animal. The little animal lost its mother and Bharat Maharaj took care of the animal and began to feed it and nourish it. And it became so, he became so attached and so affected by it that he forgot about his own spiritual practice and he neglected his own sadhana. And it happened that he died. And at, the time, at that moment he thought of the deer and he had to become a deer for one birth. Although he had been already greatly advanced, he was almost on the level of Baba, but he had to become an animal for one birth. So it's a warning to all of us. One of our devotees, uh, His Holiness Jayadweta Swami, of course he comes here often, he's no, no, no stranger to you, but he says, Bharat Maharaj got attached to the deer. We have our own things we get attached to. May not be deers, but what do we get attached to? These things, right? <laughs> Mobile phones, motor cars, all these different things. We get attached to many different things like that. Substi substitutes for the little animal, the little deer. So we have to be careful. We have to practice fixing our mind on Krishna. And Lord Krishna, in the course of speaking Bhagavad Gita, is teaching us how we can fix our mind on Him. Just like in chapter 10, Vibhuti Yoga, Lord Krishna is giving many examples by which we can think of Him. Right? He says, I am the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. He said, among beasts I am. Among beasts, Lord Krishna is? The lion, yes. Among mountains, Krishna is? Among immovable things, he is? Himalayas, yes. Many, among men, I am king. king, the monarch, yes, the monarch, right. Among men, I am the monarch, Just, it was mentioned in the purple here, Prabhupada was talking about when you have a pious ruler, then the people are happy. I was seeing, when you go around this area, this part of the world here in the Middle East, you see how the rulers must be quite pious because they built such huge, impressive mosques everywhere. It's so amazing. The, the, the mosques, they're, they're so beautiful, so built in a very majestic manner and tribute to glorifying God. It's very nice of the, the rulers because the, the rulers, they, of course, they take the money for this. So the kings are the representatives of God on the earth. And they have a very important duty. Before in England, they had the Queen of England. And they had a song they would always sing, God save the Queen. <laughs> they would always sing like that. Long live our noble Queen like that. And she did, she lived a very long life and it was described, she was coming to the, 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 Oxford, she was visiting the university and Tamal Krishna Goswami was telling me because he was at one point, he was doing his postgraduate studies, he, he was writing a thesis. So he was telling us how at one point the Queen of England had come there to the university and the professors described they said, oh, it was a very spiritual visit. She said, they said she was very divine, very powerful. So that's the position of the monarch. You know? They have special karma to take birth in that kind of position, to be a ruler. They're representatives of God. And in countries like, I know in Thailand, 
that they have a law that if you say anything bad against the king or you can be in prison, it's a crime and you'll go to court, you'll be punished. Anybody who openly criticizes anything against the royal family. Actually one time uh, the Queen of England came to visit this one university in the UK and some of the students, they decided to protest against it and they done with the Queen and they put up all these different slogans and, and they made it like a protest. Oh, it was a, it was a very big thing and it's such an offense to do. Like the Queen of England was coming to that university and these people were pro protesting, we don't need the Queen, out with the Queen, down with the Queen. They were going to close the whole university because of it. It was so serious, they wanted to close the whole university. And of course those students who were involved, they were immediately expelled from the university. And they, they would never get into a university again because they had acted in such a manner. So it's so important to show respect to the, because they represent God. So they're representatives of God. How much more we have to respect the Supreme Lord? When we go to the temple, we come to the temple to see the Lord. He is personally there in the form of the deity. He's the Archamurti. And we come to see the Lord. He's well, actually, even that mood, I said, we come to see the Lord. That is wrong. We should actually come to the temple to be seen by the Lord. But not that we're coming to see Him, that we're coming to temple, so we want Him to see us. We come to be seen. He is the seer. We, are, we have to be seen. There was one blind man wanted to go to the temple and requested his friend kindly take me to the temple and his friend said, why, why do you want to go to the temple? You won't see anything, you're blind. He said, I know, I, but I want the Lord to see me. That's why I want to go to the temple. So that's the proper mood. We should think like that. We go to the temple, we go to be seen by the Lord, not to see Him so much. Of course we do want to see Him, but our real purpose in coming is that He will see us. And we want to get the mercy of the Lord. So the Lord is there in the deity, and the, the Lord is also His holy name. Kali Kali Nama Rupe Krishna Avatar. The Lord comes in the form of His holy name. One devotee, uh, he was giving, Prabhupada had asked him to give a lecture at the time of initiation and he was talking about the uh, ten offenses and he said that uh, Krishna is in his name and Prabhupada interrupted. <laughs> Prabhupada had been listening to the class and Prabhupada said, he said, that's not quite correct. He said, you say Krishna is in his name. He said, Krishna is not in his name. Krishna is his name. When we chant the name with proper care and attention, the Lord is there and it's his, he's there. It's, he is his holy name. There's no difference. We say, Nam Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha. Purna Shuddha Nitya Mukta Vinatna Nama Namino. The, the, the holy name of Lord Krishna is Chintamani. It's a wish fulfilling touchstone. can fulfill all of our desires. And the Lord is. He's. He's like the holy, the holy name is eternal, just as the Lord is eternal. The holy name is eternal and it's full of spiritual potency and not different from the Lord Himself. So we want to remember Krishna in these different ways. The Lord is so kind that He comes to us in these different ways. <clears throat> He makes it easy for us 
to remember them. Queen Kunti was describing that Lord, the Lord in his form as Krishna is more approachable than in his form as Lord Rama. Nowadays, of course, worship of Lord Rama has become very fashionable with the opening of the temple in Ayodhya. Like now more and more people are thinking about Lord Rama and like to read Ramayana. People doing book distribution, they find they can distribute Ramayana much easier now because of all this publicity, all the uh, big propaganda opening the temple there. But Lord Krishna is more approachable than Lord Rama because Lord Rama is the king, he is the, the son of the king, so he's very majestic. You cannot approach the king so easily. When you go to the king, you have to speak the proper language. I don't know about how they do it here with the Arabic language, but I know in Thailand, when you speak to the members of the royal family, they have a special grammar which you have to use for addressing the king and his family members. You have to speak to them in the proper manner. And so they have that they have that very special grammar for using to address them. So similarly Lord Rama becomes as a the king or the, the prince, very difficult to approach. You cannot you have we see always Hanuman always kneeling before Lord Rama, ready to do service. That is the mood of the devotee, that we come, we kneel before the Lord. Even uh, I was remembering Wimbledon, you know the tennis competition they have every year, they play tennis, often the, the royal family, like the queen, now it's a king, they will go to attend that. When the final takes place, they'll come and watch. And the players who go, they have to bow. To the, you know, they will bow, they will offer their respects to the, to the queen. It's a, it's an etiquette. You have to do it. You know? Because they are representatives of God, representatives of Lord Krishna. So, they don't, common people, they don't understand. They think, oh, he's the, oh, he's the king. But why respecting them? Because they represent God representative of God. Therefore we offer our respects to them. So that when the kings are very good, then the country flourishes. He enjoy. And when the king is bad, then the people are all suffering. So Prabhupada talks about democracy, how it's created so many problems. Democratic nation. Elections, we elect the people who we want to govern us. We bring them, put them on the, uh, on the in charge of the country. Very difficult task. How long you can please somebody? You can please someone for a few. They get elected and then very quickly they're out again. A few years maybe. And then election comes and then they change everything, new government, like that. So, however, Lord Krishna, He's always the Supreme Lord. No one can ever take away His position. Everything He does is for the pleasure of His devotees. He appears in this world and He enacts so many wonderful pastimes. Common people cannot understand. They call him a thief. He stole the butter and he stole the clothes of the gopis. He did so many bad things. He stole the hearts of his devotees. He is the supreme thief. When we talk about thieves, there is no thief equal to Lord Krishna. He can steal the hearts of everyone. And of course, they say he's a lusty person, he married so many wives. Yes, but he's unlimitedly lusty. 
could could make 16 million wives if he wanted to. But he accepted 16,000 because these ladies were put into difficulty. The demon Bhomashura had kidnapped them. And Lord Krishna delivered them. He accepted them as his wives. So Lord Krishna is performing his different pastimes for the pleasure of his devotees. Sometimes he he's called also Ranchor, one who leaves the battlefield. But it's not that he's cowardly, but he had a purpose in doing that. His purpose was to bring this Kalayavana up the mountain and have him burned by Mochi Kunda. Mochi Kunda was laying in a cave there and Kalayavana came in and he kicked him and Mochi Kunda opens his eyes and burned Kalayavana to ashes. So Lord Krishna didn't have to kill Kalayavana himself. He let Mochi Kunda do it for him. And in this way, Mochi Kunda was walking from his sleep and Mochi Kunda could meet Lord Krishna and he could get the blessings from Lord Krishna. So there were so many purposes served in every one of Krishna's different pastimes. His birth, his appearance was also like the appearance of the sun. Prabhupada says the sun rises on the eastern horizon. It doesn't mean the sun is the property of the eastern horizon. In the same way, Lord Krishna appeared in the family of the Yadu dynasty, but he's not the property of the Yadu dynasty. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Aham Vija Pradapita, I am the seed-giving father of all living entities. So we're all children of Lord Krishna. We're all in the family of Lord Krishna. He is the original seed-giving father. But he likes to also have a parent. He likes to have parents himself. You think everyone else has got a mother and father. Why shouldn't I also have mother and father? You know, sometimes you feel like that. You know, everyone else has got one. Why don't I also have one? The mobile phones and things like that, motor cars, everybody's got them, I should also have one. So Lord Krishna, everyone has got mother and father, I also need to have my mother and father. So he arranges the mother Yashoda, Nanda Maharaj, they enjoy that pleasure being the parents of Lord Krishna nourishing him through his childhood pastimes. Of course, at a certain point, Lord Krishna grows up and he goes to Mathura. And Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda will left. And just like your children will grow up and leave you, they won't always just stay with you. You yourself have your mother and father, you've grown up, you're away from them. The same way your children will grow up, they will leave you, you will have to live without. We have to understand we are not the body. Don't be attached to the material body. Understand the soul which is there within the body, that we are all eternal spiritual beings. When Maharaj Chitraketu's son died, then Narada and Angira came and they, they wanted to bring uh, Chitraketu out of his lamentations because Maharaj Chitraketu wanted so much to have a child. And then finally, by the grace of Narada, his, his wife delivered a child. But somehow the, the other wives, the co-wives were jealous and they gave the child poison. <coughs> So then Maharaj Chitraketu was greatly lamented. He, for so long he wanted a child. Then when he got the child, after some time then the child died and he lost his child. So then the Radha Muni came and then they, they brought the dead child back to life. They, they said, we'll bring, it back. we'll bring this child back to life. But when the child came back to life, he said, who are you? 
You're not my mother and father. Which mother and father are you? I've had many mothers and fathers. In every birth, you have a mother and a father. Right? Bengali, there's a Bengali saying, Janame Janame Sabi Pita Matapai Krishna Guru Nahinile Bhoja Hariyai. Every living entity has got a mata and a pita. Only the fortunate ones have got a spiritual teacher, and by the grace of the spiritual teacher they get Krishna. But every living entity has got a mother and father. The dogs, the birds, the fish, the mosquitoes, everything. So don't be so much attached to the bodily designation, the mother, being a mother, being a father. That's a very temporary relationship. We come together just like people sit together on the bus or in the train. And after a few stops they get off. The same way we come together in one family and we'll be separated in course of time. We don't often think about these things until it's too late. So we don't want to get bewildered by too much family affection. At the same time, we don't want to be neglectful, but we have to constantly remember our spiritual identity. Not only our identity, but the identity of all the people around us. We have to see the soul within everyone. And that's important, especially when we worship the deity. That we see, we see Krishna there as a deity, and we see Krishna not only in the deity, but we see Krishna in everyone's heart. That every living entity is a part and parcel of Lord Krishna. And we have to see Krishna in everyone's heart. And this way, respect them, give them that proper honor and respect. So seeing Krishna in everyone. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna said, For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost to him, nor is he ever lost to me. So we want to develop that kind of vision, seeing Krishna everywhere. And Queen Kunti is teaching us to see Krishna. She spoke that wonderful verse about the vision of lotuses. Mm -hmm. That she said that Krishna's glance was like the lotus flower and he was decorated with a garland of lotus flowers and his feet are marked with the lotus flowers. So wherever we see lotus flowers, we should think of Krishna. We want to practice remembering Krishna. When we drink water, we think of Krishna. This taste is Krishna. So in everything, at every moment, we can be Krishna conscious. But we have to train our mind. We have to practice remembering Krishna. It's all practice. Just like you practice using the computer, you practice playing the keyboards, you practice cooking, you have to practice remembering Krishna. This is very important for us to make proper use of this human life that we can remember Krishna. And it, it's not difficult if we practice. If we want something badly enough, then definitely we can succeed. It's just a question of how badly do we want these things. The, uh, we, had this, we had this one devotee, she wanted very much to go to America, to get a scholarship to go to America. 
And she had to do the, the examination, you know, because English was like a foreign language. So she was doing a foreign language. She had to do the foreign, the English exam. And she was so serious to do well. In it. She memorized every word in the dictionary. So when she came to the exam in the English, she memorized every word in the dictionary. So that that kind of determination is there, you know, just for something material like going to America to study. People want these things very badly. We should want very badly to go to be with Krishna, to join with Krishna in his pastimes, to take part in Krishna's loving affairs with his devotees. And the more we practice remembering Krishna, and the more determined we are, then Krishna will fulfill our desire. They say, man proposes, God disposes. So we have that desire. Krishna can help us. We can go there to be with Krishna. Okay, so are there any questions? Any comments? Anything? Uh -huh. Like you told, we have a relation with our parents, like we have different parents in every life, so we are not supposed to be very attached to them. But we have to be more attached to Krishna. But then how to take that responsibility? We have that responsibility also. If the parents are not that Krishna conscious or not that very supportive to our devotion, so how do we take that? Well, devotee is not neglectful. You have some responsibility. Okay, so as a doctor you have parents, if they're with you and it's not too much beyond your ability, then you do what you can to help them, right? But at the same time you have some limitations. If your parents say, you know, give me money, we want to go and drink, we want to buy alcohol, or we, we're going to cook the, the chicken, or like, then we're, we won't want to cooperate for these things. We don't want to encourage that. But some limitations about how much we want to help them. So, Yes, we take care of them, we try to help them, but we don't want to encourage them in their sinful activities. We want to try to save them from sinful activities. We want to try to benefit them. The, the son is the putra, it means one who saves the father from going to hell. So the son will do what he can to save the father by his own devotion, can help the father from going to hell. So son does not want to compromise on his own spiritual practices just to please the father. You know, you get some fathers who will say, what kind of son are you? You don't come and drink with me, you know. <laughs> you know some fathers are like that, you know. So, yes, we have our standards. We, but, but at the same time, you know, if, you're, if your father is reasonable, parents are reasonable, then we try to help them, yes. Try to bring them to bring them to the temple. Try, try to bring them prasadam. One of our devotees, they were bringing prasadam home for their non-devotee family. The non-devotee family. We don't want it. We don't want to get purified. <laughs> yeah. You know, they sometimes people very uh, unfavorable. Unfortunate 
Although we try to give them purity, they don't want to be pure. What to do? I'm trying. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question on top of this same question. Um, okay. That uh, parents who are not engaged in any of these sinful activities, but they are not actively conscious as we are trying now, but they are very much attached to us as a child. Okay. Because of their attachment and when we try to detach themselves, they feel that the bond is breaking up and they try to attach more. How do we really tackle that situation? Because that doesn't help us to progress, but also we cannot detach their emotions um, and we, we go in a guilt that we are not giving them equal enough time or that enough attachment that they are expecting from us. Yes, well, you're not giving them enough time. <laughs> they want, what do they want? <laughs> they want you to be with them every moment. And sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it can be very demanding. They don't want. To, they don't want you to go any other place. You. They think your focus should only be on them, and you shouldn't be attached to worshiping God, and you shouldn't go to temple. You should only be with them constantly. It's difficult. That's why I say you have to be a little determined to understand what is your priority, that your certain things you, you cannot compromise on. You don't want to compromise on your religious principles. Okay, your parents want, want you to be there with them, but at the same time, you have, you have to have some understand your own commitments to life. Where is it going to take you? You cannot save them from birth and death. How much can we help them? We can't save them from birth and death, but we can help them to remember Krishna. They don't want to remember Krishna. <laughs> they don't want to. Prabhupada himself joked about it and said that he said one cartoon had come that the, the devotee was saying, chant Hare Krishna, chant Hare Krishna. And the mother is saying, I cannot say so many things. <laughs> they would say, I cannot say so many things, but they could not say Hare Krishna. So that unfortunate soul. But other fortunate souls are there. Sometimes they would say, and some people do chant Hare Krishna. Isn't it the end of life, at the end of life, that when one devotee had told Srila Prabhupada that he got his mother to chant Hare Krishna just as she was leaving the body. So Prabhupada was very pleased. He felt very nice. Not everyone is so fortunate that we can make our mothers in Teaching to the parents is the most difficult thing. <laughs> the most difficult. Look at Prahlad. My goodness, look at what happened to Prahlad when he tried to preach to his father. But to preach to the parents, they're the most difficult people. Because they're always thinking, Oh, you're my son, what do you know? You're my daughter, what do you know? You know? They don't like to take instruction, they don't want to hear. They think, we know, you know, you're just a child, you know, what do you know? You know? <laughs> Even you're grown up, you know, with your own family, married. But they still think, you're just our son, what do you know? So very difficult to speak to preach to parents. You know? But what we can do is, by our own example, that they can be benefited. <clears throat> you can tell them that I'm giving my pious activities to you. <laughs> I'm going to temple for your benefit, my parents. And my, my pious, whatever piety I get from it, I give it to you for your benefit. You have to tell them like that. You have to just simply be frank about it. 
<coughs> difficult. <coughs> yeah? Uh, you know why you said that kings were God sent? So then why are some of them deemed to be like bad kings who do harm to the country? Say, say louder. Um, I said, you know how uh, you mentioned that kings are God sent? So then why are some of them mm-hmm. bad kings, like the ones who do harm to the country? Well, not every king is. <laughs> you, you get some good kings and bad kings. It was mentioned some are pious kings and some are impious kings. But you know they have some they have some karma which has given them that position as a king. And so what Prabhupada was saying when they have a good king the people are happy. And when the king is bad then the people are all miserable and they suffer. So you get some kings, they become the king, but they're not very, very godly, you could say. Yeah, there, there have been a number, of the, 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 the Srimad Bhagavatam even tells us about some kings like Maharaj Venu. There was this king Venu, he was very cruel, and he, he would play with the young boys, he would kill them. And, and, and people saw him, they, he became known as, oh, here comes cruel Venu. Everyone would run away, you know. So he became, his father saw how cruel his son was. The father left, went to the forest. He didn't want to be around because he saw his son was so cruel. So his father thought, Krishna has given me a demonic son just to allow me to be detached from him. Because if you have a God, he said, if I had a good son, I would never be detached. I would never go to the forest. But Krishna gave me such a bad son that I want to get away from him. I just want to be away from him. So he went to the forest. And later on it happened, the brahmanas cursed him. The brahmanas cursed him. And then from his body, they turned out a, a, a very good devotee. So, yeah, sometimes we, you do get kings who are not good at all. What can you say? You can say, well, it, uh, maybe it's the karma of the people that they have, they have the destined to have that kind of role. Of I have one more question. Yeah. My this question is primarily to learn from your personal experience as to how you have progressed during some time of your life. That's why I'm asking this question. Was there anything that in your uh, young age or in the past life where you were attached to something and um, you had to detach that and it took some, some efforts from your end to get disconnected to it? What was that? What was your transition period to progress in this journey? How did you tackle the challenges in that detachment, provided if there was anything? Yeah, well, of course, you, that you get attached to different services. You know, sometimes you're, you're put in some position, responsibility, and you know, you're trying to do something, you're trying to do some service, and sometimes it's Something just doesn't work out, things go bad, you know. You you know, you moved out, you know, they don't want you to do this anymore. You 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 stop, you know, you go you can't do this anymore, we want somebody else to take over, you go somewhere. So that happens, you know. Yeah, you just you have to be detached. You just have to accept that oh, okay. Krishna wants somebody else to do the service. So find some other service. It takes some time, you know. You have to find some other place to do service or some other service, maybe in the same temple. Just find some way that you can keep yourself busy and engage in Krishna consciousness. But we, we see it all as a, le- a lesson from Krishna Krishna is teaching us to be detached and not to be attached to any one particular thing, one particular situation that we have to be detached in. 
especially detached from the results. And don't be so attached that, oh, I have to do this, I have to be here, I have to do that. We have to be flexible that we can give up everything and go some other place, find something else to do. So that's usually what happens. <coughs> Certainly, I, I have these kind of experiences, different services sometimes, you know, managing or running, trying to run centers or looking over departments or something, and something didn't go well. Or... Okay. What about the people who lie behind behind you and how do you tackle that people? People what? Uh, There's some people speaking. who speak lie behind you or they try to defend you. Lie? Yeah. People lie behind them. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. She she's asking what if there are people who lie behind you, behind your backs. So how to tackle with how to tackle them? How should we not tackle? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what should we do in that situation? Well, certainly a test of tolerance, right? And Lord Chaitanya has told us we should be tolerant like the tree. We should think, you know, I must have done something to offend this person in my past. Maybe I, maybe I spoke lies sometime in my past life or something, and, and therefore, they're, you know, this is coming at me. But we have, we have to see all of these different things, and somehow it's the Krishna's arrangement to put us into these difficulties, just to make us more attached to Him, to become more attached to Krishna, detached from the material world. Somebody is telling a lie about us, if it's a lie, then in the future it will become known that this is not true. Yeah. That in the, course, in the course of time, the truth will come out. We cannot hide the truth. So somebody is speaking something which is not true, may be there for some time, but after some time then truth will come out. People will know what is actually true. And then they will know. Actually, in most of the situation, it's not what we have done, it's what we are. Like people do such a thing with us. So, I mean, it's not something I did, but it's something I am, or uh, the position I am in. So, so that's what people uh, feel like they are saying, you know, in your life. So, what can you do in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> it's not something I did, but it's something I am. <laughs> so, the, so the question is, if I'm let's say at a position, and because of that position, people are jealous of me. Yeah, not that position, which what something I am, I my have, nature, yeah. my nature. You know, my nature, my relation, anything. Right? Then what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> Same question. <laughs> what do we do? Well, <laughs> depend on Krishna to help us to come like, through. Like, uh, uh, Kaun's supposed to uh, want, wanted to kill, uh, then he should. They are not because what they have done. It's just because they are born of a dead people. So, that's what the situation is. Not sure how to put it exactly. You mean it, it, something just in, inherent in our nature? Yeah, nature or creation and just into that relation. Hmm? So if we understand it like that, then it's easier for us to accept. Mm -hmm. that this is, this is just my nature. I'm sorry, <laughs> you can apologize to people, I'm sorry if I've offended you, if you don't, but I just have that nature. <laughs> and it's something which is inherent in me. And I can't really, I haven't been able to r remove it. And if it's giving me some pain or trouble, then I'm sorry. We can always 
be like that, we can be apologetic to others. So they take offense by it. <coughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> I don't know how we... Certainly, we have faults, we have things, so many things in our nature which are not right, which are not perfect. What can we do about it? We can, we're, we're, we're trying that... I'm on the path, I'm trying to do something about it. I'm practicing Krishna consciousness and I'm sure that in course of time I'll get rid of all these faults. And we say, you know, if somebody is in the shower taking bath, you cannot criticize them for being dirty because they're in the shower, they're cleaning themselves. So in the same way, we're in Krishna consciousness, we're engaging in bhakti yoga. So we're working on it, we're trying to do something about all of our faults, all of the things which are bad in us. We're working on it by practicing Krishna consciousness. And gradually, we'll become better, gradually we'll improve. So, you can ask me, just please give me more time, <laughs> and in the future I'll try to be better. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Oh. Initially, we could not introduce Maharaj, so I request Radha to introduce Maharaj. And uh, we are very, very fortunate to have uh, Maharaj with us. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I came to know Maharaj is here, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to have his blessing. We uh, are very fortunate to have His Holiness Bhakti Vidya Vinasana Narasimha Swami Maharaj. The Holiness is a senior disciple of His Divine Jesus Prabhupada, has been in this movement from 1971, in the early days in London, when Maharaj took uh, the first initiation. And I think the second initiation was next year itself. And uh, His Holiness has been, I forgot was asking about Maharaj, you know. So I remember my early days in Jew. Maharaj was there in 1979, that time in Jew. And uh, he used to be very particular about the Magarati. Dot and never missed it. I think I used to see him always very regular. And he was very close to his oldest Kamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. Maharaj, you remember that. <laughs> and uh, he, of course, uh, been preaching in the most uh, difficult areas, that is China. How many understand Chinese? Yeah. <laughs> very difficult. And uh, China, Philippines, China, Philippines, Japan, Vietnam. Yeah, Maharaj, of course, I know. I've seen the videos. <laughs> and uh, of course, he's been coming to the Middle East also. And uh, exclusively, I, I, he's also the faculty for Nagar Institute for uh, so many years. And so many wonderful devotees will come through the courses that he's been conducting there. And uh, Maharaj well versed with the Shastra, of course. So this is a simple way to uh, glorifying, but uh, much more. And uh, to welcome and for his good health. Uh, we had a Krishna 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 Hare Krishna Hare 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 for all of his efforts. I also dress the Parikrama in Mayapur every year. So I've been once again. <laughs> yeah. So we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Mahal with us and uh, also seen a devotee like uh, Mahaprabhu. Uh, I'd be scripted this guy why senior devotees and devotees were very so dear to the Lord. At this advanced stage, also they're traveling. Anybody knows? Why are they traveling? Why are they coming to us every now and then? What is the purpose? Anybody knows? To? Preaching. Preaching, okay. Why would he preach? Krishna consciousness. Saving us. Krishna consciousness. Okay, to spread Krishna consciousness. 
What is it for us? We should know. To right? shower mercy. Yes, to shower mercy. Okay. What else? Them to get more closer to Krishna. Okay. It helps them also get closer to Krishna. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful shloka in uh, Bhagavatam that we could uh, recite. It's called Kirti Kovan Kurvanti Tirthani. I'm sure that many of you have heard. So we, let's offer this shloka to Maharaj uh, with all our heart. Uh, and you can repeat with me. My Lord, devotees like your good self. Devotees like your good self. Are verily. Are holy places for some time. Holy holy places places for some time. Because, because you carry, you carry the, supreme the Supreme Personality of Godhead within your heart. You turn, you turn all places, all places into places of pilgrimage. So Maharaj, we are all morning we say, no? Sansar Dava. So Maharaj has actually come here to bless us all. Like Maharaj said, you know, we don't go to take darshan of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Actually, Lord should take darshan of us. So we should request Maharaj to shower his mercy on all of us so that we can continue to progress. Let us all loudly chant three times Hare Krishna Mahamadu Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna Hare 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 uh, birthday of Kumal Mataji and she has very kindly sponsored some Krishna books for all of us. Anybody who doesn't have a copy, we have few in Hindi and few in English. Those who don't have, yeah? <laughs> don't take it for your friend, let them come. Yeah? So those who don't have a Krishna book, Jinti Bhav Krishna book nahi hai, 10th hand to be Bhavan ki Bharat, laga tha dekhi aap ki leela bata rahe hai. Prabhupada ji ne ye leela ni haan pe capture kari. All the childhood past name, all the Krishna leelas are here in this book. This is not the leela, this is Krishna book. Bhagavatam ke no shlokas, it's all stories. All stories, Hindi English both hai. So those who don't have, please come and take it from us. Though Hindi mein hai, rest all are in English, but if you want more, we'll give it. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Now, with Krishna, or first week, first week of March, who wants to take we have eight eight. Are you सिर्फ आठ हैं तो जो आरे फटा फटा फिर बाकियों को बाय मंगवाएं सबको स्पंसर वाले को Hindi. Now we have two Hindi. Hindi, Hindi. One Hindi. And there are some small books anybody wants to take. The book is called Chant and Be Happy. This is by Prabhupada. Anybody else wants this book who doesn't have Anybody else? 